Hey everyone, welcome to part seven of the Azure Masterclass V2. And in this part, we're gonna dive into virtual machines and virtual machine scale sets. Something that really provides a foundation of a huge number of services we see in Azure. Now, if I think about the basics of a virtual machine, the whole point is this is an infrastructure as a service. So when I think about those layers, and I'll draw this up again in a second, when I think of the layers, we're responsible for everything inside the virtual machine. So the guest operating system, any runtimes, the app, everything. We just don't have to worry about the physical fabric. But this really does build the foundation of many of the things we actually see in Azure. So if I think about for a second the idea that our plain vanilla virtual machine. So we can draw our, our poor little VM that's never fully appreciated. It's kind of, hey, it's waving to us. Hey there. Now remember when I think of the layers that we talked about before, in terms of responsibility, I can think that all of the things such as the hypervisor, so Azure runs on Hyper-V, so the hypervisor, the um, compute, so the servers that actually host the virtual machine, the storage that gets used maybe for diagnostics to host and manage disk that it stores durable state on, and the network, all of that is the responsibility of Microsoft. So they are responsible for the health, the care and feeding of all of these layers. But then everything above that line, so everything here, the responsibility this and above is you. And when I think about what those responsibilities are, things like patching, when I think about antivirus, when I think about the firewall, I need to make sure that's configured, it's up to date. I might think about backup. Where's the state I care about? Hey, am I backing that up? How frequently am I backing that up? Maybe I need high availability to some sort of replication maybe to another location. I might think about various types of configuration desired state configuration, chef, puppet, PowerShell, DSC, I'm installing something, and there's a whole list of other things that you are responsible for. Now, you're not on your own. As we're gonna see in Azure, there are many extensions, there are services that provide all of these things I drew, there are things that do that for you. But you're responsible for picking, hey, I wanna enable this. And there may still be aspects of administration that I need to do. But when I think about this, plain and simple virtual machine, it really is foundational for a huge number of other services in Azure. So I can think about something we're gonna talk a lot about today is a virtual machine scale set. Well, a virtual machine scale set, well, that uses virtual machines. When I think about richer platform as a service offerings, I might say something like, hey, AKS, so the Azure Kubernetes service, and that has different parts to it. Well, hey, there's a control plane that's just purely managed. I don't really do anything with that. So that has things like the API server, that has the scheduler, that has the etcd database, there's a bunch of other things. I don't see that at all. This is all managed for me. But then what there are is node pools. And it's the node pools where I actually have, hey, it's my pod. My pod runs on a node and a node pool. Well, guess what? Node pools, they use virtual machine scale sets, which uses that little humble virtual machine. If I think of a service like the Azure Firewall, this great appliance, well, guess what? Azure Firewall is built on top of a virtual machine scale set which is using virtual machines. If I think about a lot of the flexible managed database offerings that we have in Azure, like flexible MySQL, flexible Postgres, they're built off of a virtual machine. When I have advanced connectivity and I have gateways for ExpressRail or VPN or all of these different things giving me access to other dimensions and networks, that's built off of a virtual machine scale set which is built off of a VM. So my whole point of this picture is you might wonder why I spend so much time understanding a VM. 
It's the lowest service in Azure. I don't really care. I'm going to do bigger and greater things. Well, most of them are actually built on top of a virtual machine. So understanding the capabilities of a virtual machine, understanding different SKUs, the sizes, the extensions, how I interact with it, that's going to apply to all of these higher things that really sit on top of that little basic virtual machine. So it's really important to understand that. And it also is really easy to understand for a lot of people because I'm used to the idea of a virtual machine on premises, be it on VMware, be it on Hyper-V, be it on VirtualBox, doesn't matter. The concept of a virtual machine is familiar. We're taking a physical resource we have, the host that has physical amounts of CPU, physical amounts of memory, physical amounts of network connectivity and storage, and we're dividing it up into virtual pieces of hardware that the VM can then leverage. That's the whole point of virtualization. We're virtualizing the hardware to present virtual hardware to this virtual machine. And you have full access to everything inside it. When you create a VM, there's no partitioning to what you can do inside that guest operating system. Now, the hypervisor is still off limits to you. There are certain aspects that are exposed through the Azure Resource Management, be it via the portal or the CLI or the RESTful API, it doesn't matter. There are features exposed, there are configurations you can do, but I don't actually directly interact with the hypervisor. But once I'm inside that VM, do whatever you want. You have full administrator rights, you can do anything you want within that. But it does mean you're responsible for everything. As I draw on that picture, all of those things that go along with it, be it patching or backup or um, antivirus or firewall configurations, all of those things, you have that responsibility. Now, when I think about the virtual machine, as I talked about, hey, there's this physical hardware that's divided up. But often we have very different types of workloads. And those different types of workloads use different types of resource. Like a database is very typically memory heavy. It uses a lot of memory. It may use some CPU when I'm doing certain types of operations, but it's largely very memory driven. And it might be very throughput on the storage driven. It's very different than maybe something like a domain controller, which maybe is more CPU driven. Then there are other workloads that are more balanced. So like t-shirts, we have small, medium, large, we have loose fit, we have athletic fit, we have all these different types so too do we have for virtual machines. So there are different fits, and there are also different types of processor and capabilities that are exposed to us. So let's actually flip over for a second and think about, oh, wrong button. So let's think about what those resources, I mean, really are as we think about the virtual machine. So I might first actually think about, if I think about the virtual machine, let's think again about the work, the load that is coming in. So if I think about the load, so this is some application, some process, some interaction that has to get work done for. So I can think about, well, it has a certain amount of CPU requirement. Now this could be in terms of, hey, it's performance, maybe the power of a single core, maybe it's single threaded, and then maybe it is the number of cores, is it hyper-threaded workload? I might think of the amount of memory this workload consumes. So this would just be the size of memory. I might think about network. So there's a certain amount of network communication. Now that might be the network for the request or the interactions coming in but it also then might generate other network traffic as the thing it's talking to has to go and talk to something else over the network. So I might think, well, there, there's bandwidth, certainly, but I also have to think about things like latency. Latency can be a bigger deal than the throughput, the bandwidth, because if every operation I perform takes 100 milliseconds to get a response, and I'm very chatty, I'm constantly going back and forward, 100 milliseconds will kill the performance of my application compared to two milliseconds. And that can happen sometimes if I take an app and maybe I move the database to Azure, but I leave the app on premises, well, suddenly I've added this huge latency between the application and the database, which again, if it's very chatty, it's gonna kill the performance of the application. It's often why we have to co-locate the application with the data tier. So I have a low latency if it is a chatty type app. Maybe it needs a certain type of storage. 
maybe from a storage perspective, I think, sure, there's a capacity. I have to store a certain amount. But once again, I might have the idea of a certain performance. And performance, we typically think about in terms of IOPS, operations per second. And we think of throughput. So the throughput would depend on the number of operations I'm performing, but what is the size of that operation? So the very small operations, um, the throughput may be pretty minimal. Whereas if it's a very big operation, I'm doing a lot of them, the throughput would be very, very big. And again, I might care about the latency. Hey, I'm doing an operation against the disk, how long does it take to get back? So if I think of the load, the work coming in has requirements, and I can think of a shape. I can think this load, when I consider all of these different things, gives me a certain shape. I'm gonna think there's multiple dimensions to it. Maybe it's not a rectangle, it's some weird, peculiar type shape. And I could think of, well, there's memory, there's CPU, there's network, maybe this is a storage. So there's a certain shape that really is all about the ratios. Hey, for every one CPU core, I want two Gibby bytes of memory, or four Gibby bytes of memory, or eight Gibby bytes of memory. And this is how we think about the virtual machines. When I think of a virtual machine, the key part here is you're gonna have these different SKUs. So I'm gonna have SKUs. So a SKU is a stock keeping unit, it goes back to the old days, I guess in stores, where you had SKUs which were certain products. There's different SKUs. And if we think of the shape of the workload, well, there are different shapes of the SKUs. There might be a fairly even ratio of, for example, CPU to memory, so maybe it's a general purpose. There might be ones where it's more memory focused, so it's more like that. So they're memory centric. There might be ones where it's more CPU centric. So there are different SKUs of the different types of virtual machines. And then within each SKU, there are sizes. Hey, is it, is it a little general purpose or is it a medium size or maybe it's a really, really big. So there's different sizes within them. And my whole goal when I think about this is I want to find the VM SKU that best matches my shape of the workload. So I'm not wasting. I don't want to waste resource. Could I fit this in a general purpose? Sure, but then I'm wasting a lot of its CPU capability. If this is a more memory focused workload, I want to find a VM that's more memory fo focused, so not just got a bunch of CPU sitting there idle. I want to make it actually do the work. And that's really a, a key point when I think about this. Now, the other thing I want to focus on for a second is we draw the idea of a virtual machine. And sure, we have this VM thing. But the reality is, I, I talked about memory, I talked about CPU, I talked about network, and there are different aspects to those dimensions of it. Firstly, I talked about virtual hardware, the whole point of virtualization, I'm taking a physical box and I'm dividing its resources into blocks of virtual hardware, which have a certain almost quota, a certain amount they're exposed, so we can't go and steal another VM on the same boxes. And we can divide up, hey, a certain number of virtual CPUs, certain amount of memory, certain amount of storage, because the physical box has a certain capacity. And so we wanna divide the physical box's capacity up proportionally to the virtual machines running inside it. So looking at the dimensions of a virtual machine, well, firstly, there's the virtual hardware itself. So I can think of the virtual hardware, and in Azure, there's two generations. There is a generation one and a generation two. And we're gonna talk more about this. And this really goes back to Hyper-V. So Hyper-V is the hypervisor that Azure is built on. It has Gen 1 and Gen 2 virtual machines, BIOS, UEFI. That's really the, the big difference. And that, that then exposes other things when I get into UEFI that, that we like. I can think about well, the processor. So with the processor, there are many different dimensions to that. I can think, firstly, 
or just how many virtual CPUs I have. Now you might hear me say virtual CPU, you might hear me say core. Physical processors today have multiple cores on them, I think brains, but often they're hyper-threaded and hyper-threading duplicates certain components of the core to, hey, if it's waiting on something, or well, it can carry on and do something else. It doesn't double the, the performance, maybe you get a 30% improvement, it depends on the type of work you're doing. But when I talk about a virtual CPU, it's a virtual logical processor, which could be in one of those hyper-threaded cores. So we talk about virtual CPUs. What is the brand of the CPU? So we often think of Intel, but there are also ones that are based on AMD. There are also ARM. ARM gives me a really nice price performance ratio today. Obviously it tends to have a smaller instruction set, but there are special images that support ARM and I can run those in Azure now. I might also think about, well, the performance of those. So there's something called the Azure Compute Unit, which we'll talk a bit more about. But this is a relative scale of the performance of one VM SKU and its version compared to other VM SKUs. And maybe it has a burst type capability. So there's a special VM SKU, the B series. It gives you a certain amount of provisioned CPU, but I, if I use less, I can accrue credit and burst out for a period of time, like my cell phone. If I don't use my minutes, I can carry them over and I can be more chatty. Now I did mention version. A key point in Azure, just like in the real world, physical hardware advances. There are new processors get created with new instruction sets. They have optimizations. There's new networking hardware, new storage capabilities. Memory gets quicker. And so the physical underlying generations, and this is different from the generation of the virtual hardware shown to a VM, the actual generation of data centers, well, there are advances in the physical hosts that run the virtual machines. So what you'll see is as the physical hardware advances, you'll see different versions of the VM SKUs. For example, maybe there was a DV1 that was created in the early days, when well, there has been many hardware generations since then, so now there's a DV5. The DV5 has a higher performance compared to the V1. And so that's what the version is when I look at a VM. It's because the physical hardware advances, and so there are newer versions that can take better advantage of it. Now you might say, why bother? Why not just, hey, if I happen to create a VM, and it's a D-series, and it's on a newer box, I get better performance. Where's the harm in that? The harm in that is I don't have a consistency. If I also in this same, maybe it's a server farm and I'm adding some new instances. If some of those VMs were on older hardware, let's say it was the equivalent of a V1, and I add two more and they happen to get put on where the V5, they're gonna run significantly faster than these other ones, but my load balance maybe just distributes traffic evenly. So these would be sitting here doing nothing while these are getting a lot more. So it won't have the effect. So I want consistency. So the point is version say, even if I created a V1 and it happened to land on a newer host, it will have its performance throttled back to match what a V1 is. That's the whole point. And then it's up to you to choose hey, actually, I'm gonna start using the V5. I wanna take advantage of those newer things. So that's all your capability. And there are features. Oh, wrong color. And we have features. For example, most of the processors today support hyper-threading. So uh, there's obviously hyper-threading being used to power these cores. I might have hardware-assisted virtualization. That means the instructions that let me run a hypervisor, a type one hypervisor on top of the physical processor, which is what Hyper-V does, those same instructions, they're actually exposed inside the VM as well. So I can actually run a hypervisor inside a virtual machine because it's exposing that hardware assisted virtualization. There might be things like um, SGX, and software guard extensions. So this is part of the confidential compute security. 
There's also SKUs from AMD that encrypt the entire virtual machine. Whereas the Intel SGX creates a secure enclave that I would write my application to specifically use for just certain code that needs that extra security. There might be boost. Hey, it can up its speed temporarily. I have things like memory. Now memory, uh, often you'll see in this Gibby bytes, which seems a little bit weird. Why isn't it gigabytes? We're used to gigabytes, not this Gibby byte. A Gibby byte is a true two to the power of 30. Um, a Mebby byte is two to the power of 20. A Kebby byte is two to the power of 10. So it's the true 1024, etc. Whereas really strictly a kilobyte would just be a thousand bytes. So uh, a gigabyte would be a thousand to the power of three, so a billion bytes, which isn't really how it's measured. So gigabyte is technically more accurate. Often they're used interchangeably. We don't tend to super obsess over it, but that is the reality of the difference between them. So you might see gigabyte, but realize that's what it means. We're used to the whole thousand and twenty-four. Then we have network. And once again, with network, we might think about, well, how many adapters do I have? It's many VMs that you have multiple adapters, but also what is the aggregate bandwidth? So what is the total? When it tells you a bandwidth, it's not the per NIC, it's across all of them. Again, this is all software-defined networking. There's no separate physical cards that's exposed to your VM. It's hey, this is the total throughput that we're allowing you based on the total of the physical box. We're dividing the physical box up into VMs, and so we're giving you a proportional amount of the network. I can think of storage. And there's different types of storage, remember, because I can think, well, obviously there's local inside the host itself. Now that local storage has a certain capacity, and it also has a certain performance. We use, I guess also I'll say type. For the temp disk, it's gonna be an SSD, but also there could be NVMe. It could be a special type of VM that has local NVMe storage for really, really high performance. But also very commonly, we want remote storage. And when we think of remote storage, we're really focusing here on managed disks. That comes out of the storage bucket of the virtual machine. So that's a really interesting thing. If I'm using something like NFS or SMB or iSCSI, that's not coming out of the storage capability of the virtual machine, because it's going over the network stack. So if I'm talking SMB or NFS or iSCSI, well that actually is going that way. It comes out of this bandwidth. So maybe I'll draw that actually. So if I think of things like SMB, or NFS, or iSCSI, um, well, actually, that takes the network path. It's not using your storage numbers of the VM. But this will be, hey, my managed disks. So I can think about, hey, how many managed disks can I attach? What is the total performance I'm allowed for that storage? And that's gonna have things like, how many IOPS? What's the throughput? And also there might be um, different capabilities around, well, there's different types, maybe it has burst. Maybe I can exceed those numbers for a short period of time. And then what types are supported? Because we have things like premium, S, there's ultra. So can it use those types as well? So we have different storage aspects. And this is really important when I think about hey, I create a managed disk, and a managed disk has a certain type and a certain performance, I have to make sure that, well, where's the bottleneck? Because if the disk's capabilities are beyond the VM's capabilities, the VM will be the bottleneck. If the VMs are greater than the disk, well then the disk is the bottleneck. Maybe I add more disks, I make it bigger, or I just hit the performance I need. Maybe there's no bottleneck, this is what I want, and I'm good. But it's important to never forget about the VM's dimensions to that as well. And then there are special ones. So if I think also there's this idea of special, because some of them do have that NVMe storage. Some of them have GPUs. 
That might be used for graphical, that might be used for machine learning. There's different ways we use those N series. Some of them have InfiniBand. They're high performance compute, they have these massive network pipes between them. But the whole idea is you have all these different aspects to what we think about is our, our little virtual machine. So we have to always think about those. So those different VM series have a focus on the types of the resource. So we can actually go and have a little look at this. So here are the sizes for virtual machines. And notice straight away, it talks about down here, this general purpose, compute optimized, memory optimized, storage optimized, GPU, ones with FPGAs, etc. So if I was to look at compute optimized for a second, well, the key point here is notice there's sizes. So within this SKU, the SKU is the F, there were sizes, size two, four, eight, 16, 32. There's also a version. So this is the V2. So there've been some advancements in the hardware over the V1. And based on the size, we get different amounts of resource, but it goes up proportionally because I'm taking up a bigger slice of the physical underlying host. But this compute centric has a ratio of one to two. For every one CPU, we get two Gibby bytes. So there's that nice Gibby byte, not gigabyte. Notice storage is also in Gibby bytes. So it's all to the powers of two, not powers of 10, which is what Giga does. So we have these different sizes. If I looked at general purpose, and notice there's lots of different versions of these. So I can see, well look, there's a, now the DC, the C, means it's that confidential compute. And there's different types of the confidential compute we have. But then there's like a V2, there's a V3, there's a V4, there's a V5. So they'd have different performance characteristics. They may have different capabilities. Maybe some of them have hardware assisted virtualization, some of them don't. But in this general purpose world, my ratio, once again, their size is, it's a one to four ratio. And notice this one, well, it doesn't have any temporary disks. It has no temporary storage available. But there's a different skew, which is DD, it's a little d, the little d in the name, and the little s means it can use premium. So you'll always see these little modifiers to the the skew, so D means, hey, I have temporary storage. That's only for the newer skews. If you don't see the little D in the old ones, it just has it by default, most of the time. So hey, I can see the temporary storage, and once again, hey, I see the different sizes, but it's that one to four ratio. If I look at memory optimized, so maybe I wanna run a database, well, hey, my database ones, it's a one to eight ratio. So you can see those different sizes. Now also in here, it's telling you about some of the features it supports. Hey, nested virtualization. Hey, which VM generations does it support? Does it support accelerated networking? We talked about that, where we have those virtual functions and we map directly to those to bypass the V switch ordinarily. So we cut down latency, we increase performance. Do we support an ephemeral OS disk? Well, no, we don't because there's no temporary storage. So I can't do that on this series. If I looked at the S, no ephemeral either. If we look at maybe a version with temporary storage, now it does have ephemeral OS disks. There's enough space that it can go and create its OS drive for the VM using the temporary storage that gets allocated to it. So it's why it's important to understand these different capabilities to see, hey, what, what's it actually doing? What are the capabilities I have? Notice there's ones that sometimes are A. So if it's A, it's AMD based. Now again, sometimes the series is just AMD based. But if I look at the EA, it'll tell us, hey, this is leveraging AMD's third generation Epic processor. If I look at the non-A, it's gonna be some Intel, there you go, Xeon processor. If I look at the EP, hey, this one's based on ARM processors, and it's the ultra ARM-based running at three gigahertz. 
And then there are ones that have GPUs. There are ones that have NVMe drives. So we can see it talks about, hey, we have this local NVMe SSD. So it's just this crazy large amount that's gonna get me the capabilities I need. And this is the point. The whole point of all of this is you want choice. I have different requirements. Hey, sometimes my workload requires really, really fast ephemeral, i.e. non-durable local storage. Or oh, maybe I use the L series, that has that. I need a huge amount of memory. Maybe I need a huge amount of storage throughput. Maybe I need a huge amount of network. And if we actually went and looked for a second back at these VM types, one of the interesting ones they recently added, I think it's an EB right here. This EB series is all about the idea of having just this higher remote storage performance. So when you look at the numbers for these virtual machines, yes, it has the regular CPU memory, but when you look at its network bandwidth, when you look at its max burst uncached premium, he has some really big numbers. 120,000 IOPS, four gigabytes per second of throughput. Just really, really big numbers. So, hey, I'm running some database. Um, I need really big performance. I can do that with these. So I would really make sure I understand what is my requirement. What do I really need to get out of this to make sure I'm picking the right skew? So there really is a huge emphasis on understanding this so I pick the right skew and then I pick the right size. Now remember, I don't want instance, remember our resiliency module. I wanna have at least two typically spread out over availability sets, racks or zones, data centers. So my size is not one VM is the right size to handle all of it. It's how can I divide it up into maybe two, three, four, and then maybe if the load changes, I, I change the number of them based on the time of day, based on the work coming in to best match it. So that's gonna be a key factor as well when I think about this sizing. So I really wanna make sure all of those things are understood, but it's critical, I understand it. Now, you can change it. There's generally a lot of flexibility. I have to shut it down, but I can stop the VM, change its size, and start it again. It'll get reprovisioned onto a new host that matches because the physical boxes that run these might be shaped like the types of VMs. So there are physical boxes with more memory maybe. There are physical boxes with those NVMe disks. So if I change the skew or change the size, my VM may have to move to a different underlying host, which is fine, we don't generally care. Some features might limit that movement, like availability sets would limit you into a cluster. If I'm using proximity placement groups, it's limiting me to a certain portion of a data center. It's why if I use proximity placement groups, what I wanna do is make sure I create the most exotic biggest VM first. So my proximity placement group gets pinned to a portion of a data center that would support that type of VM. Then I go and create the boring DV4, the EV4, whatever that might be. They're not really boring, they're fantastic. But I create the most exotic. I'd create that N series or the L series first to make sure I'm placed in a portion of the data center that's gonna support that more exotic type of virtual machine. So we talked about their sizes already within that particular type. Now there are some VMs that are virtual CPU constrained. And all that means is it's the same VM, but it basically hides, let's try this again, it hides some of the cores. So I still pay for the regular VM, but notice it's got this dash two MS or dash four MS. It's gonna only expose this many virtual CPUs. Now it's telling me it's the same spec as this one on the right. I'm still gonna be paying for an M8, but I'll only see two CPU cores. Now that may seem absolutely bizarre. Why on earth would I wanna do that? If I'm running something inside the VM, that charges me per core, maybe like some database software, 
I don't actually need the CPU, but I need the memory that was associated with that size, hide the cores from the guest OS so it doesn't see them, so I don't have to license the software for that number of cores. But again, remember the, the VMs are a certain size, so I have to make it a certain size maybe to get the memory amount. I don't care about the processor amount. So hide the cores, I don't wanna see them. I don't have to pay for them for that software product. And I talked about this Azure Compute Unit. So the whole point of the Azure Compute Unit is this is how you measure the performance. Now it's all relative. But what we'll see, for example, here is, hey, I talked about the DV3 um, was 160 to 190. It's got a higher number because it sports this boost capability in the processor. Then you'll see the DV4 is a higher number because they've got better processors. You'd also see it's a two to one ratio because it's using hyperthreading. So the physical underlying core on the box is actually hyperthreaded and then gets exposed as virtual CPUs. It's why, if you look at the DV2, it looks like it's got lower performance. The DV2 has got higher numbers than the DV3. So that makes no sense. Well, the DV2 didn't use hyperthreading. So the, it was a, a core to a virtual CPU. Now in the V3 and above, it's a hyperthreaded, so a logical proc per virtual CPU. So again, you get some benefit, but it doesn't double it. So which is why on an individual virtual CPU, the performance goes down and they price them accordingly. It's not like, oh, suddenly I'm getting worse performance for my dollar the pricing reflected that. Now you might notice some of them are actually missing. Like the V5s are not shown here. Why are the V5s not shown here? Well, we can go over on the left and look at the benchmark scores. So we'll go and look at Windows. And what we see is the app they're using is CoreMark. And that's really old. And it does have CoreMark scores sometimes for some of the, the newer ones. And if we looked at Linux, we can see the scores for some of the Linux ones. And those Linux, they do have the V5. So I could go and look at what the score was for the V5. But once again, it's using CoreMark. And honestly, the issue is when you think of the CoreMark, it is old. And the whole point is CPUs improve. They get new instruction sets. They change the way instructions work. And the challenge is CoreMark doesn't really consider that very well. And so I think the reason they stopped showing that ACU for all of them is simply because the way CoreMark stresses the CPU is not representative of how modern CPU instruction sets bring value to the workload. So it's not always evaluating it very well. Like what instruction set in the CPU am I using for my particular workload? Well, that's really gonna then vary the result of how high performing it is. So if you don't see an ACU, it's probably because they just felt hey, the tool they're using, and maybe they'll change it, don't know, is not really reflecting it. Generally, you're always gonna see about a 15% performance improvement on average. So the V5 from my testing is about 15% better than the V4. It's just that's not listed in those uh, main documentation. So that's sort of the core VM series and sizes. And then I did mention there were VM generations. So it is built on Hyper-V. And Hyper-V has Gen 1 and Gen 2. And the whole point here is that Gen 1 was BIOS based. So it had the old BIOS based, it had a master boot record, whereas Gen 2 uses a GUID partition table, GPT. Gen 1 had that little NTFS system partition, where well, Gen 2 has an EFI system partition. So they're, they're physically different on disk, which is one of the reasons I can't just switch from a Gen 1 to a Gen 2. The physical disk footprint is different. So to move from a Gen 1 to a Gen 2, I have to convert the disk. There's not a native capability today. There are scripts out there that can do this. There's not a native in Azure today to switch from Gen 1 to Gen 2. It may change over time. Check documentation as always. Maybe it's changed. But that's why I can't just switch from a Gen 1 to a Gen 2. So Gen 2s are UEFI based. It enables technologies like Trusted Launch, those software guard extensions and more. So if I look at my picture for a second, and I drew this Gen 1, Gen 2. So the whole point here really is that, hey, this is BIOS, and this is UEFI. The UEFI lets me do things like a virtual TPM, virtualization-based security. These things 
I use is for Trusted Launch. So there's a feature I can turn on for a Gen 2 VM that uses Secure Boot. Hey, it checks the, the path from the UEFI through to the OS to make sure there's no rootkits in the middle of it. It leverages the virtual TPM. It le leverages virtualization-based security to make sure there's not bad things happening. BIOSpace is an IDE boot. That's why I can only have a two terabyte boot disk. It uses SCSI for the data disk, which is why I can add remove them. And even though it's IDE, as soon as it starts to boot, it switches to a synthetic path, so I don't actually lose performance. But UFI is a SCSI boot. So it gets rid of that two terabyte limit. So there's improvements I get for that. So there is this big difference. They're different images. So the OS, because of this difference in that underlying, remember this is this master boot record, whereas this is using that EFI, the, the GUID partition table, and it's got that EFI. So because of these differences, I have to have different images. So there's a different set of images, they're split, if it's a Gen 1 or a Gen 2 image. And often for the major operating systems in the gallery, you'll see a Gen 1 and you'll see a Gen 2. Now if it's confidential computing, you'll only see a Gen 2 because they leverage, hey, the UEFI and all of those capabilities. But there is a fundamental difference between the disk footprint and the virtual hardware that's exposed between a Gen 1 and a Gen 2, which is why we can't just um, simply switch between them. So not all SKUs support all generations. It's in that list that we saw already. And VM images are generation specific. Even though we have Gen 2 in Azure, the VHDX disk format is not supported. It's only VHD. So if you're not sure what VM you should use, there is a virtual machine selector. So it's a handy dandy tool that we can go to and basically all it does is it, it asks you questions. So it might be, I say, hey, by workload type, or hey, the OS and the software I want to run. If I can say, hey, I want to start there. Uh, I will consider all of them, maybe. How many CPUs do you need? How much memory? So this is now going to be able to work out the ratio. Do you need special CPU or GPU features? And basically I can go through and it's going to tell me, hey, what's the right SKU for the type of workload I'm doing? And obviously, hopefully, by now from an Azure perspective, you understand, based on the SKU and based on the size is how much you're going to pay. And it's how much I'm going to pay per typically second that it is running. Remember, if I stop the VM, don't stop it inside the guest operating system because it will stay provisioned on the Azure Fabric. I'm still paying for it. I have to see it stopped on the Azure Fabric to stop paying for it. So if I was to go and look for a second at a VM, what I want to see is this magic word, deallocated. That means, ding, 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 I'm not paying for it anymore. If it just says stopped, it means, hey, I've stopped it in the guest because I went into Windows, I did shutdown but the VM is still provisioned on the underlying host, I'm still taking up space, Azure's still billing me. So make sure you do shut it down either through the APIs or I shut it down through PowerShell or CLI or the portal, but make sure you do a full stop. What I don't wanna do is just shut down the guest because then it's still provisioned, I'm still paying for it. Now, even when it's deprovisioned, remember, I do have all these different aspects that make up the virtual machine so if I have storage, for example, and when I talk about this, this is a managed disk, that doesn't get deleted for a regular VM because that's got state on I care about. So I'm still paying when I think of this remote for this. So this is costing me money as well. Even if I stop paying for this, unless I delete the VM and its disks, this managed disk, I'm still paying for. If there were other things like, hey, it has um, a public IP and it's one of the ones that I'm paying for, I'd still be paying for that while it's in existence. 
So there's different aspects, but make sure you consider all of those things. Speaking of which, okay. So, what are the building blocks of a virtual machine? Because it's not just a VM. There's actually a lot of different things when I think about what makes up a virtual machine. And what I'll do is I'll run through them pretty quickly here and then we'll draw it out. So obviously I can think about, well, sure, there's the idea of the VM. Now, even a VM, there's an option called Spot. And Spot is really about the fact that Azure, Azure seems infinite. Azure seems like I can go and create a VM anytime I want, there'll always be space. Well, how do they do that? They have to have a huge number of boxes with spare capacity. And there's entire engineering teams looking at trends, looking at how things are getting used to make sure there's enough underlying capacity to handle any incoming requests. But don't just sit in there idle. So what Microsoft offers is Spot. And Spot is, hey look, we're gonna let you use this space for cheaper than normal. Maybe the price even varies depending on how likely it is other people want it at this moment in time. And I could say, hey, I'm willing to spend up to this, but at that point, just deprovision it. Stop it. I don't wanna pay more than this price for it. But if a regular pay-as-you-go workload comes across, it will kick me off. So this would be really good for workloads where I have the ability to stop and start them, like a batch process. There's some batch process that's interruptible that if they stop me, I don't care. When I can start again, my work would resume from the point it was at. So it's really good if I have some resumable workload, but it's not time critical that I have to finish in this time. No, I wanna get it done, but I've got some flexibility. Let's use Spot and save money on that. And we'll see this. So if I go and create a new virtual machine, and we'll just pick a, resource group, and I'll pick a region. One of the options we've got right here is run with Azure Spot discount. Now I'm gonna change my size quick. Let's pick that one. And let's say yes. And it now gives me two choices. Capacity only. Capacity only means I'm willing to pay up to the regular rate. So I pay whatever its price is at that moment in time. Maybe it's two cents, maybe it's three cents, maybe it's five cents. But even if I'm paying the regular rate, it goes to that, it's still gonna kick me off if a regular pay-as-you-go workload needs that space. Or I can say, no, no, I don't wanna spend potentially that much money. I'm gonna say price or capacity. And then what I can put in down here is how much am I willing to spend? And basically it's saying this is the absolute bottom rate, four cents an hour. I can put in a rate that must be at least four cents an hour. So maybe I'm willing to spend six cents an hour. If the price for that moment in time goes above that because, hey, Azure's getting busier, other people want the workload, they'll kick me off. And what's nice is I can actually see the history. So with this little link, and I can get this um, from an API as well, it shows me based on my region that I picked, but also other regions that are close to me, what the rate is at any different moment in time. So what I would see here, unless I'm really married to South Central US, my better option would be to go to West US 3. It's half the price. So I get this much lower price if I change. But the other thing that I can look at, what's the eviction rate? What's the chance of me actually getting kicked off? And these are tiny, zero to five. So basically it's a very, very minimal chance I'm gonna kicked off. But this helps me decide which SKU, I can even say, hey, show me some different SKUs to get an idea of, hey, how they run, what their pricing is, regions that are close to me to optimize that all up set of spend for that. So Spot is super attractive if I do have that workload that just isn't super time critical. I just, hey, it needs to run, but it, hey, it runs when it runs. And it is resumable. What I don't want, it's been running for eight hours, it gets kicked off, then it has to start again. I've just wasted eight hours of money. It has to be resumable for that to be a useful thing. Then we have the number of NICs. 
and some of them it's one, might be four, might be eight. Remember, they can each connect to a different subnet, but it's always within the same virtual network. Um, the OS disk, maybe it's ephemeral, is using that either temporary storage or the cache space available because I don't care about the operating system. I can just, I've got some infrastructure as code, I've got Chef or Puppet or PowerShell DSE or it's part of the scale set. I can just recreate it. There's no state in it I really care about. I don't want to pay for managed disk and I'd like really, really low latency, which I get from local storage. Let's just make it ephemeral. I'll just use that instead. Most have a temp disk, some don't. The newer SKUs, there's that little D modifier that tells us, hey, we have a temporary disk. Might have data disks, I can pick the caching. Is it read-write caching? Is it just read caching? Is there no caching? A lot of database, we don't want any caching, for example, so I can configure those aspects to it. There are extensions. Now, there's a huge number of different extensions available. There are extensions that maybe just let me run uh, a single command. There are custom script extensions that I can run entire scripts. There are extensions to do antivirus. There are in um, extensions that run in a chef or a puppet or a PowerShell DSE. There are huge numbers of different extensions. So these will give me additional capabilities that help me get the VM to my desired state. There are VM apps to actually go and install up to five apps per VM into this. Do I want a public IP linked to my network configuration? Do I need InfiniBand or GPU or NVMe? Am I using availability sets or availability zones or proximity placement groups? Do I need a managed identity? A managed identity we'll talk about in later modules, but this gives the VM an identity in Azure Active Directory. And if I'm running inside that virtual machine as a process, I can get a token as that identity without knowing any credential. The fact that I'm in the VM lets me get that token and I can then present that to other services like a storage account or a database to get access to it. So I don't have to save any credentials anywhere, but it's just native inherent to being running inside that resource. So I might want to turn that on. Do I want to use an on-demand capacity reservation? I talked about spot. I talked about the idea that there's this infinite amount of capacity, but there isn't an infinite amount of capacity. There's a finite amount. There's a lot of it and there's a lot spare, but what if I have a workload that absolutely positively has to run in this region, in that zone of this exact VM SKU? What if there's been a disaster? I want to guarantee with an SLA, I can create my VM of that type in that zone, in that region. Well, that's what on-demand capacity reservation does. Essentially, as soon as I create it, I start paying for it. I'm reserving that room, I'm paying for the room. It's reserving me the slot on the host. And I can create a VM into that reserved slot. So I, I guarantee I can create it. So this will be for those really, really high priority workloads. So if we draw out this idea of just the aspects of my virtual machine, so sure, I hope, oh, no, definitely not green. We never use green for the cloud. It's just, it feels wrong to, to do that. So sure, I have my virtual machine. Remember, my virtual machine is of a certain skew and size. It's also of a certain generation. And then we have resources. So a resource that we add to it is a NIC maybe multiple. Remember, it's the NIC that then goes and connects to, and it's not actually part of the VM configuration at this point, it connects into a certain subnet, and the subnet lives on a certain VNet. So that gives me connectivity. Remember, each NIC could connect to a different subnet, but of the same virtual network. And maybe optionally, I have a public IP linked to a particular IP configuration on the NIC. So there's really on top of the NIC, there's IP configs. Let's sit on top of that. And again, there's N number of those. And then those could optionally have, actually, it's optional to a dashed line. I could have that. 
I'm going to have an OS disk. I always have an OS disk, but it doesn't have to be a managed disk. So this could be ephemeral. Or it could be a managed disk, it's durable. We don't think about unmanaged disks anymore. I mean, maybe some, I don't even know if I can even create it anymore. Like there used to be, hey, I had a, a VHD in a page blob. We don't leverage those anymore. I might have data disks, but they're optional. And as part of that, I can say, hey, what's the caching? Is it read? Is it write? Is it just read? Is it just write? I have control of those things. I also remember, maybe, <laughs> maybe have a certain amount of temporary storage. It does depend on the VM SKU. There's also a certain amount of cache, potentially depending on the VM SKU. Remember, if it's an S variant, the little S, it means I can use premium managed disk and kind of the ultra. This is typically a little d. In the newer SKUs, older SKUs, you just need to go and look at the type. I can also potentially have those extensions. They're optional as well. I can have extensions. I can have VM applications. And actually, I'm going to draw that in later on. We'll, we'll see where I'm going to play with that later on. I'm not going to do that for right now. I could also have, hey, my Azure AD a managed identity. That could be user assigned, where it could be used by multiple resources or system assigned. It's tied to a specific VM. There might be special things. It could be GPUs, it could be NVMEs, it could be that InfiniBand, it could be FPGAs, whatever. Depending on the SKU, it may have those things as well. There's a whole bunch of different capabilities, and then I may add this into an availability set, an availability zone, a proximity placement group, so I can be close to other resources I put in the same proximity placement group. Maybe it's an on-demand capacity reservation. I've got this reserved hotel room that I want to create it into. So we have all these different types of resource that I can actually do. Now, there's all these different aspects, and we see this when we create the virtual machine. So if I jump back over for a second, and just carry on through this a little bit, hey, do I want spot or not? I can pick the image, and we'll come back to this, but there's like Windows, there's Linux. The security, hey, is it a trusted launch? So it has to be the Gen 2, it's even telling me, Gen 2. Or maybe it's a confidentiality. So the confidential virtual machines, well, that has to be a special type. Confidential is something C. So if we looked at C all sizes, now you do have these little filters at the top. So maybe I can add a filter. Um, so I could do size, generation, type, and I could change it to, hey, I want confidential compute. And it's actually, I, mean, I don't have rights in a lot of them. But hey, there's the DC series. Um, but it's not letting me create these. I don't have quota. Don't have quota to create those either. And these are only supported in certain regions or zones, for example. So depending on what I want to use, they may be available in different places. But I can go and pick a certain VM size. Depending on the OS, there's a different administrator account. So obviously Windows does one thing. Linux can be a password or a key, and it will go and store it in Azure for the keys. So that networking, it gives me the option to add an NSG, which generally we don't want to do. Generally, the NSG we've done at the subnet level. We don't particularly want to do it at um, the NIC, but I guess uh, for complete this, I'll draw it on. So technically, at, at this level here as well, I could optionally add in the idea of an NSG. Again, I would rather do the NSG at the subnet level than have a, it doesn't give me extra security. They're still applied at the virtual filtering platform on top of the vSwitch anyway, and it just gets hard to manage. But technically, it's going to prompt me and say, hey, do you want to do this thing? I was like, no, I really don't. But then it will give me options around the disks. Hey, I can go and add 
additional data disks. We can see here, create and attach a new disk. But it's also in here in advanced, I have this ephemeral disk. And depending on the VM SKU, maybe I can create it using the OS cache allocation, or maybe I can create it using the temp disk um, place. In some of the SKUs, it might show you different numbers for sort of cache or temp. Sometimes it's blended together. It's really coming out of the same bucket. So you may see different things. I can go and pick my networking. Hey, I get a network interface, and this is where I can say, do I want a security group? Do I want a public IP? Do I want to link the NIC with the VM's life cycles? If I delete the VM, the NIC doesn't get left around. Do I want to add it to a load balancer? I can add extensions like, hey, I can integrate with Azure AD. I can integrate with an automatic task to shut it down at a certain time. That's really useful, especially in dev. Why pay for it if I'm not using it? So that auto shutdown will just shut that down at the time I specify. I can integrate backup straight away. I can integrate with guest OS patching, which we're going to talk more about. I can integrate with log analytics, a storage account. Um, and then I can go and add other extensions. Oh, I didn't complete all the data yet. But once I've completed the basics, I could see all the different extensions. Let's just fill this in. Test. It might be enough. I wonder what it's moaning about. Let's just do none. Let's make this Windows. Local admin sure. Just making saying up. Oh, maybe I'll type it right. Maybe I won't. All right, there we go. Nope, go away. And then under advanced, maybe now it will let me, yes. So I can see there's a whole bunch of extensions. The Azure AD one, auto manage, we're gonna talk about. Custom script extension, run a script. Can be useful to inject some configuration. Also, Microsoft anti-malware, network watcher agent, open SSH for Windows, PowerShell desired state configuration. So there's all these different capabilities that I can inject in. I can add in VM applications, which we're going to talk about later on. I can even paste in some custom data, which is kind of weird. Um, but again, this is uh, just something I want to be available as part of its provisioning process. I could populate user data, which again will be available within the guest to go and query and get this value. Do I need NVMEs? Is it in a host group? Is it using a capacity reservation? Is it in a proximity placement group? I can add tags like every other resource. So you get all these different options as part of that provisioning process. So it's just a, a ton of different stuff that I can actually do. Now on the supported operating system side, obviously I can do Windows and I can do Linux. There's a huge number of these available. There are even client SKUs for Windows. There's different licensing here um, about being able to use Windows client, but if you check into the details, it will go through that. If it's Windows Server and I have Azure Hybrid Benefit, I can bring and use an on-prem license, maybe in addition to if it's data center and I have Hybrid Benefit, maybe it's for an overlapping 180 days while I'm migrating, but I, I have to use it in one or the other eventually. There's different, lots of different Linux distributions available as well. So there's a huge number of images in the marketplace. And we could probably just go and look at this super quickly. So if I go back to home and we just go to marketplace and I look at, well, first it's got these recommended ones. But if I just go and look at compute offerings, no, it says Windows, there's Ubuntu, there's Ubuntu Server, there's RHEL. And there's just a huge number of different distros available. In fact, if I super quickly jump back, and we just click the Linux link in here, this will show me the endorsed Linux distributions on Azure. And I can see sort of Canonical, SUSE, Red Hat, Oracle, some of these different partners. There are different versions, so there's there's also, let's have a look over here. 
how the exact support works for these. There are sometimes these matrix of, hey, where the agent can be used in different ones. So there's a whole bunch of different sets of capabilities that are exposed, but essentially, there's the operating system. Is it supported by the vendor or not in Azure? And then well, there's a VM extension. There's a guest extension that Azure installs. Is that available? For example, uh, Rocky Linux was a fairly new one. Rocky Linux now is supported by Azure. It has an extension. But remember, there's a lot of different extensions. So if it's a newer distribution, maybe it has the core extension. Maybe it's missing some other extension. So you'd want to go and check are all the extensions I need available for particularly the Linux distributions that I want to use to make sure I don't get into some weird state. I can create my own images and then I can easily make them available through, I need to actually replace that. It used to be called the Shared Image Gallery. What's actually now called is the Azure Compute Gallery because it's not just images as we're going to see. So there's the marketplace images. So this is the golden image that's going to get used to be copied to populate that OS disk. Or I can create my own. And then, hey, I have the apps added on top of it. Now, in most cases, I want to try and have my images clean, i.e. vanilla. I don't want a whole bunch of software in them because then if the software app has to get updated, I have to recreate my image. It's much better to have a small number of images that I just have to get the latest patches into. And then at time of deployment, I bring in the software packages as part of maybe a pipeline, maybe as part of those extensions. So on this picture, when I have this extension, this could be used to run, hey, a custom script extension, install this software. Hey, I'm using PowerShell DSC. I want this to have this in it. I'm adding a VM app. So really, I don't want to have the image that's going to get used to build this OS disk full up with 10 different applications. Then I have to maintain a huge list of golden images. And I, every time there's an update, I have to update 20 different images. I'd like one image that can get used for lots of different things, because it's just a different configuration file that will inject in the software or enable the role for its end purpose. So I'd like to try and keep the images as clean and honestly as minimal as I possibly can. Now, sometimes, just don't want to share. Your VM is isolated from other VMs through the hypervisor, through the software-defined networking, through RBAC. It's walled off from anyone else. But sometimes there are regulatory requirements, or you're just so paranoid about this workload. I don't want some other machine sitting on the same box as my machine. There's just some reason I cannot do that. It's super, super sensitive. Even the tiniest possibility, I don't want to risk. Now, potentially by not sharing, I do get some additional maintenance controls. There's different types of maintenance, which we'll talk about. There's maintenance of the underlying physical boxes. There's maintenance of maybe the VM image. And then there's guest OS. There's different types of maintenance. Technically, if I'm not sharing with anyone, one of the things I can do is you can have the idea of a, a maintenance control. And I create maintenance group where I can configure when I want my patches applied to my hosts. Now that only applies when I'm not sharing. So that's when I've got this isolated VM or dedicated host. So that lets me be a bit more picky about the schedule, I have to give it a 35 day window and a two hour maintenance, but I get to pick a bit more about that. But even without this, um, even if I'm just a regular virtual machine, I can now say if there's a type of update that's gonna impact the running of my VM, like it has to actually reboot the underlying host, I can self-serve that update. And what that means is by self-serve is it's telling me this is coming and before that happens, I can say, I want to do the maintenance now. And what it will do is it will shut down my VM. It will move it to a host that's will basically start it on a host that's already had the patching done. And I'm finished. So even if I'm on a shared environment, I'll get 35 days notice if there's ever maintenance coming that's going to impact the running of my VM. And I can self-serve. I'll say, hey, look, I've seen the notice. 
No, I don't want some random time. I know my app has a maintenance window on Sunday at 8 p.m. So at Sunday at 8 p.m., I'm gonna go and say, hey, perform maintenance. It's gonna shut my VM down and start it on a host that's already got that host maintenance done. So I, don't, I would not use these only child options just for maintenance control. There's other things I can do. But if it is that regulatory requirement, if there is some reason, these things exist. And there's different types. There's isolated VMs. So an isolated VM, well, it's pretty simple really. An isolated VM is you have the host Remember the host has certain amount of resources, certain set of capabilities. So an isolated VM just takes up the whole host. There's nothing special about it. It's just so big, no one else can fit on it. I, I ate all the pudding. There's no pudding left for anyone else. So an isolated VM is just so big by virtue of the fact that it's so big, no one else can fit on that box. Now the danger of this is, remember hardware advances. So potentially over time, a machine that used to take up the whole box, so these are some examples, and look at the numbers, E80, so that's 80 virtual CPUs, 104, 192. These are big, big boxes. But over time, and it's telling me, hardware limited lifespan, because as boxes get bigger, what used to fill up the box doesn't anymore. In which case you'd have to make a decision. You'd have to say, okay, I'll make it bigger so I keep taking up the entire box or it's not gonna be isolated anymore. So that's a choice I can make. The nice thing about the isolated, there is nothing else special, nothing at all. It's just a VM, it just happens to be so, so big. Then we have the concept of dedicated host. The dedicated host is different. With dedicated host, let's go and look at this link, I'm buying out the capacity of a box. Now I have to buy out a particular SKU. So we'll see there's different SKU types of the box. And it has a certain number of processors that I can create on it and a certain amount of memory I can use of it. So we'll see these available virtual CPUs and available RAM. It, it is key to understand it is available virtual CPUs and available RAM, because remember, the physical hypervisor, the parent partition, there's still other stuff that will use up a portion of resource. So this is the amount that you'll be able to use in the VMs. And it's why sometimes they're different numbers, depending on the type of virtual machine that you're gonna create on it. But what I can do here is I'm buying out the entire host, but then I can fill it up with the equivalent VM SKU up to its capacity. So what we're talking about here is, well now, I have the same idea of a host, but now it's a dedicated host, and it's of a certain SKU, and then what I can do inside, I can create VMs of that SKU. Now they can be different sizes. So this is a SKU four. I could also create a SKU, has to be the matching SKU of the box, a SKU eight. Maybe I'll create SKU twos. So now I get the flexibility to create different sizes within there, but no one else is allowed on that box. I reserved it. My box, I'll create what I want on side there. No one else is allowed to touch it. So that's another option that we have available to us. There's also Azure Stack Hub, Azure Stack Edge, Azure Stack HCI. So this by nature of Azure Stack Hub is a great big turnkey appliance that gets delivered to my data center that I run my workloads on. It's Azure, in my data center, but it doesn't integrate with the Azure Cloud. It's its own portal, its own RESTful API. Um, it's very much a separate beast from regular Azure Cloud. Whereas Azure State Edge is an appliance that ships to my data center, but it's managed by the cloud. It's regular Azure. Azure State HCI is 
it's an on-prem set of hypervisor hosts running a special version of Windows Server, with Hyper-V, with Software Defined Network, with Storage Spaces Direct, with the Windows Admin Center, it integrates with Azure services running on-premises. So I'm basically creating VMs. I'm not sharing, it's running on my stuff. And then often I'll bring Arc. So Arc takes the Azure control plane, so tagging and monitoring, um, policy, um, extensions if it's virtual machines. I can bring Arc for operating systems, Windows and Linux. I can bring Arc for CNCF compatible Kubernetes. And then once I've got Kubernetes managed by Arc, I can then bring Azure data services like SQL MI and Postgres. I can bring down app services. I can bring down AI services that run on created containers on that Kubernetes, but I'm not sharing. It's my infrastructure that I've got Arc on. And then there's actually some bare metal solutions. So bare metal, there's no hypervisor at all. I'm literally running an OS on the hardware. Now this is only supported for SAP HANA and Nutanix cloud clusters. An SAP HANA, I can run on VMs as well. It's a choice, but if I really at those maximum levels, hey, I can just actually run it on bare metal as well. And there's certain different time requirements for that, as you could imagine. But hey, this is the other option. So here, I'm running on bare metal, so it's, it's still a host. But now I'm not using VMs. These are all just still VMs. All of this, this is a SKU-8 VM. It's still talking to the virtual network. It's just a regular VM. This is not. This is now running an operating system. It's not running the same sorts of environment. There's different ways I would have to integrate and use this. So there's no VM in this world. But on top of it, I'm running that, that app. So I'm running my SAP or I'm running that Nutanix. So it's specialist workloads that just don't work well on a hypervisor or it's not supported on a hypervisor. So now I have those um, other special type scenarios. So we have that as well. So that's if I don't want to share um, mine or mine. There are maintenance considerations. So VMs can encounter different types of issues and maintenance. Things can fail. A VM, as we've seen, runs on a host. The host can fail, the rack can fail, a disk can fail, a data center can fail, calling can fail, power can fail. Things fail. Maintenance is required. Hey, I have to update the underlying hypervisor on that box. Now, Microsoft are doing some very clever stuff with hot patching. They can patch in-use memory areas to avoid having to reboot. So the amount of times they have to reboot stuff is very, very low these days, but it can still happen. But there is planned maintenance. Now in those no reboot scenarios, sometimes they might live migrate your VM to another host. Sometimes they use something called VM preserving host update, VM foo, PHU. It will pause it while it does something and then it will just unfreeze it. It doesn't clear the VM's memory, it just gets paused for maybe 10 seconds and it comes back out of it. But if it does have some impact, they'll give you that 35 day notice and you could self-serve if you wanted to. Now Azure actually runs a special version. They run the Azure Host OS, which is a super condensed version of Server Core. I think it's something like 280 megabytes is the WIM. WIM is the packaging format used for Windows. So it's way smaller than even Server Core. They basically stripped out everything that they don't need to act as a hypervisor and control plane for Azure. It also obviously reduces the amount of patches you need. It reduces the attack surface of this thing. It only runs exactly what it has to. There's unplanned hardware maintenance. Things fail. There's unexpected downtime. Make sure as part of your architecture, as we talked about in resiliency, I'm using availability sets or ideally availability zones to give me that reduction in impact. If there is an impact, it has a certain blast radius of what it impacts. If I can be over availability zones, even if there's an entire data center level problem, it's only gonna impact the workloads in that AZ. So if I'm spread over three AZs, hey, my other two thirds is fine. I'm still running. I might take a reduction in capacity, but if I've got scaling, I'll scale back up. 
and I'll it'll just be a momentary drop in capacity, but I don't actually go down. Maybe if I was running at threshold, maybe it'd be a bit more laggy for people interacting with it, but it doesn't actually go down. And don't forget about using multiple regions in the event of a regional outage. Um, and then obviously there's the OS inside. You have Windows, you have Linux, that has to get patched. And we'll actually talk about that now. So what can I do to help patch inside the guest? So with different approaches, Windows, Linux, they have a kind of auto. In Windows, I can say automatically patch me. And on Patch Tuesday, I mean, it's periodically checking, it will go and get them, it might prompt me, and it will just reboot. I could do that. Now, the downside of that approach is there's no orchestration. If the guest is just automatically pulling down its updates and then automatically rebooting, if I have eight VMs that make up a farm of some scalable, resilient backend service, well, if they all patch and reboot at the same time, I've taken down my service. So I don't like that if I'm in a multi-instance scenario. And also, what if there's a problem with a patch? I may not want it to automatically install on every node because then if it does break something, it breaks all of them. So that may not be a nice thing I wanna do. I could use a third party tool. Remember, responsibility. I'm responsible for inside the OS. I don't have to use some special cloud tool. If I'm using Windows Server Update Services today, if I'm using System Center Configuration Manager today, if I'm using APT or YUM or ZIP or whatever it's using, if I have a solution today for Windows or Linux, I can carry on using it in Azure. I don't have to do some special thing. I might have a fantastic patching solution. It orchestrates, it rolls out patches in groups so my app never goes down and I'm happy with it. Fantastic, use it. Um, the only thing I would say is, where's the source of the patches? If it's on-prem in a, some sort of distribution point, well, I'd probably want a, a replica in Azure so it's not traversing my link to on-prem every time it's patching. So maybe adjust your architecture, but if you have a great solution that works for you, don't change it. Just bring it into the cloud. In the same way, if I had a new data center, I'd probably have a replica of the repository for the patches in that data center, so it's not traversing my WAN. Azure, location, have a copy of it there as well. I can do it manually. Uh, there's Azure Automatic Guest Patch Orchestration. Now this is a step up from just letting the guests do it. It's just an extension. It's gonna kick off monthly. When the patches are released, it checks every few days. It's gonna get applied within 30 days. It will use as the source whatever the guest OS is configured to use. So if the guest is using WSUS, it will still use WSUS. It will still use APT. It will still use YUM. It can be an external or an internal. It doesn't care. It's gonna use whatever the source is. It's only gonna install security or critical though for Windows, for example. It says limits in what it's gonna do and it's gonna install in the regular off-peak. Now the benefit this brings over just letting the guest do it is it does use this availability first model, which we see in some other things in Azure. And what that means is it does kind of region by region. It wouldn't do paired regions at the same time. It would do availability zone then by availability zone within the region. If I'm using availability sets, it will use the update domains, update domain by update domain. If it detects things are failing, it will stop. Um, it will sort of roll those things back. So there are benefits that this brings above just that basic guess. There's different options. This is what this automatic does, off-peak availability first. There's also update management center. Now this is a new version that replaces update management. So there's another solution, and it's here today. Update management uses Log Analytics Workspace and it uses Azure Automation, but it's very flexible. I have a lot of control over when it rolls out the patches, but people don't like the Log Analytics Workspace side of it. They don't like the Azure Automation side of it. So what Update Management Center does is it gets rid of Log Analytics, it gets rid of Azure Automation, it uses the Azure Resource Graph as the source of truth for the inventory of the patches and what is required it takes all of the management side and the components away from the end user. 
But now I can choose the types of patches I want to install, not just critical and security. I can control the timing of when they get applied to the operating systems. I get a complete history of the patching. It supports hot patch. So if I'm running, for example, the special Azure version of Windows Server Data Center, it will use hot patching within there. I can create categories of my machines. I can have a time window for different groups of machines. And then I can approve the patches I want. So what this does is it takes it to another level to give me a lot more flexibility for the actual patching. So it's a choice. There's capabilities in Azure to help with my Windows and my Linux. But ultimately, it's an operating system. If I have a solution today that I like, you can carry on using it. I want to talk about the Instance Metadata Service, the IMDS, just because it's kind of cool. And there's really two sides to this. I can think about there's an endpoint inside the guest operating system. So I'm a OS, I'm running inside the VM. And I can reach out to a special IP address and I can find out information about the Azure environment surrounding me. So if I was, let's go back up here for a second. So I'm this VM, what I can do is there's a special endpoint. Now, what color shall I use? Just to use this one. There's something called the Instance Meta Data Service. And it's a special IP address, 169.2. 5.4.169.254. This is fairly easy to remember. So only inside of a, something running in Azure, I can ask it stuff. And obviously I'm asking it via my network configuration really, but the whole point is I can ask it things and get information. Because there's this configuration about the virtual machine. So if I jump over, let's go into this VM. So what I'm doing here is I'm just inside a virtual machine. And what I have to talk to, and really the only bit you care about here, is I'm calling a RESTful interface on 169.254.169.254. I'm just making a call to it. So I'm using PowerShell, I could use anything I wanted. So resource point, raw, it's just getting the raw information, and I could dump it out. So this found information about my virtual machine. And then what you notice is there's this content. Now I could go and look at the content. I can actually convert it from JSON and make it look a lot prettier. But now it knows about a whole bunch of stuff about the virtual machine. So it now knows things about itself. I know my VM size. Look at that. I would know if I'm in a VM scale set. I Oh, I can get tags information. I can look at the tags about myself. That's, that's kind of cool. Or I can actually use a nicer way. I mean, this is just a formatting thing on how I'm interacting with REST from this. But I could actually just go and get the JSON. I say maybe I only want the compute aspects. So here, if I run it, I want to get information about the compute side. So again, I've got the tag list here. I can see my SKU I'm using, things like the OS. I can see which resource group I'm in. So this is all by talking, and this time I'm saying, hey, I want to talk to the compute side through that same instance metadata service. So it's just, it's really useful to go and get information from Azure. And then there's something else. I showed you user data when I was creating the VM. And if we jump back over here for a second, let's close a whole bunch of these windows. If I go and look at my VM, I already populated some user data. So if I go and look at my, uh, my configuration, probably go forget where I put this. Yeah, user data. So I created some user data and I set it to be hello test one. So this is a way using the Azure Resource Manager fabric, I can go and put some data in the Azure arm and fetch it from within the guest operating system. Now, 
The way I actually populated that is I went and got a token and I got my hello test as data and I just converted it to base64 and then I wrote it into that virtual machine. So I created a JSON body and then wrote it with a web request. And this is in the repository, you can go and see this exact code. So I put that, hey, hello, test one, into it. So now within the guest operating system, I can actually go and fetch that. So let's, let's go and, did I run that? Yeah, I think I did. So that's that data, but it's base64 encoded. But now I can unencode it. And there's hello test one. So from within the guest operating system of a VM, I could go and fetch some data that I put as user data through the Azure Resource Manager. Now you might look at that and you might be like, so? It's really powerful. Imagine I'm deploying a whole bunch of VMs and remember we talked, I don't want specialized images. Maybe there's some farm and they each do some, maybe some unique thing or they configure themselves in some way. I could just populate that user data slightly differently for the VMs. Inside the VM, it could have that custom script extension to run a script. It looks at the data and does something slightly different or configures some value based on that user data. So without me having to do anything special inside the guest, I'm telling the fabric, hey, here's a bit of data I want to make available. Something inside the guest OS can then just look at that and say, oh, okay, there's my value. I'm gonna do something with it. So it's actually really, really powerful. And then there's also metadata available about the VM that I could actually go and fetch. One of the most popular and useful things I could do is, well, actually, let's jump over super quickly. So if I go back to my window for a second, what about if I want to know the creation date of this virtual machine? That's traditionally pretty difficult to do. Well, it's metadata. So once again, I can query the metadata of my VM. So I'm calling the virtual machines API. This is not using that IMDS. Remember, this is outside of the VM. I'm just running a regular VM. I'm just talking to the Azure management endpoint. And I'm just fetched. So I've, I've got a token based on my company logged in context. I make the query and I'm gonna enumerate it. And it shows me the creation date of all of my VMs. That's nothing I created. That's not a tag that I added at time of provisioning the VM. It's actually stored as part of the virtual machine and now I can go and query it. So that often comes up as a, hey, how do I know when my VM was created? Well, that metadata is a really nice way of doing that. Talk about a lot of management things so far. Maybe I don't wanna do the management. I need, to, I need it to be a VM. There's some workload I have that has to run inside a VM. It doesn't support containers or app services. But I don't really bask in the joy of backup, of patching, of worrying about those things. So Azure has an Azure auto-manage capability. That doesn't cost me anything specifically, but obviously pay for the underlying services that it then uses. There are different configurations. So the whole point of different configuration profiles is, well, if it's production, I probably care about backing it up. Whereas if it's dev test, I don't. So here I can see, hey, there's two configuration profiles there's production and there's dev test. And it's telling me, well, hey, look, insight monitoring, which costs me money, it goes to log analytics, we're only gonna do if it's production. Backup, which costs me money, we're only gonna do if it's production. So we can see these top two, only if I'm production. But Defender for Cloud, do you know, I want that on everything. Patching, I want that on everything. Change tracking and inventory, yeah, all of these things I want on everything. And we can see it's for Linux. We can see it's for Windows as well. And it has that same breakdown. Basically, if it's dev test, don't turn on the semi-expensive monitoring which goes to log analytics and don't turn on the backup. I just don't care. 
but everything else we'll do for production and we'll do for dev test. I can also create my own configurations. Maybe for example, I have my own backup, uh, sorry, uh, antivirus solution would be a better example. I don't want to use the native Microsoft one. So I could create a configuration profile that does all of the things except using the antivirus because I want to use my one. It doesn't support virtual machine scale sets today, but um, it's free and it just makes it a little bit easier. It takes away some of those responsibilities for me to worry about on this. So again, we think about those layers of responsibility. So a key point here is for a lot of this, I could think about, well, Azure Auto Manage. Man, sometimes I forget how to spell very simple words. Uh, Azure Auto Manage could optionally do a chunk of that for me. And it's not costing me any more money, it's just gonna go and configure those underlying services. Now these obviously do cost me money, but it will go and do a lot of that for me. So that can be a very useful thing. Okay, moving on. I said <laughs> shared image gallery on a previous slide. I missed it. It's actually now called the compute gallery because it does more than just shared images. So yes, this enables the versioning and replication of resources. And the replication is a really important part. This is a regional resource. I'm gonna create this in a particular region because it's gonna store stuff. But I can configure to say, hey, I want it replicated to this region and that region and that region. It's gonna cost me money. I'm gonna pay for the storage in each of the regions. But that's a really nice capability in terms of resiliency. But if you think about it's storing images that I'm gonna to use to create VMs, it's storing applications that I'm gonna to use to install into VMs, I want it close to that resource. So this is gonna let me really manage once and then have locally to all of the different things. So it can support images and it can also support VM applications. And I can actually share this and make it available across subscriptions, even across different tenants. So the key point about this whole service is, let's just do the whiteboard. So I think, okay, let's just use that purple. I'm gonna create a compute gallery. Now that compute gallery, remember, lives in a certain region. So it lives in a certain region, but I can replicate it to other regions. The compute gallery, first these images. So I'm gonna have an image definition. Now that's gonna say things like it's um, Windows, it's Linux, it's specialized, it's generalized. Generalized means, hey, in Windows I've run sysprep on it. So now it's ready to be duplicated. Um, it's certain VM generation. Um, and there's certain licenses, so there's certain CPU or memory requirements. And then within there, I'll have one or more versions. And one of the really nice things about the versions is that if I create a new version, there are services in Azure that will say, hey, look, there's a new version of the image that I was built off, like a VM scale set. I'll start rolling that out automatically for you. I don't even have to do anything. Now that version is built off of a source that I point it to that makes up that version. Now that source could actually be a marketplace image. So it could come from the marketplace. It could come from a disk or it's actually multiple things. It could be a VM. I just point it at a VM. I shut it down, use that. I could have created a managed image I could have created a snapshot. I could even create a VHD. I could use that. So there's some source that makes up the version. And so when I think about creating a virtual machine, 
that OS disk, well maybe it was created from a particular image that I have inside my compute gallery, or maybe I just use one directly from the marketplace. Then we also have the idea of VM applications. And once again, a VM application, I have the idea of the definition of the VM application, and then I have images. And then once again, I have the version is built off of an app package. So I have the, the binaries or the, the MSIF or whatever that is, this is in some storage account as blob. So the version is built off of the app package and also it's built off of some commands because I have to know how to use the app package. How do I install it? How do I uninstall it? How do I update it maybe? So different commands that I link as part of the application and then I can take those, I remember I talked about extensions, well, as part of the provisioning and the, the creation of a VM, I can have up to five VM apps per VM as part of that provisioning timeline. So we have that capability that I could just go and build in. So this compute gallery is really nice for enabling all of those different things. Now, I guess I should show it super fast. So, if we come over here, let's close that down. If I just do compute gallery, if I was to just go into my gallery, and there are some really cool sharing options. So I could share this based on regular role-based access control, but I can also do something called a direct share where it goes to a specific sub or tenant where everyone just gets read access to it. I can also create a community gallery. So then anyone with an Azure subscription gets read access. Think some public scenario where I wanna just make things um, available. So I could, I could go and do those. But what I wanna focus on right now is, so I've got my gallery. I've also got some definitions down here for an OS and an app. If I did an add of an image, it's going to ask me the questions. Hey, is it Windows? Is it Linux? Is it Gen 1? Is it Gen 2? Is it generalized or specialized? What's the architecture? What's the publisher? And then it's also going to let me create a specific version. When I do a version, well, I have to tell it what's the source image? Where am I getting this from? And I get the same if I was to create an application. I'd create a definition for the application. I say how I want to make it available. And then once I create the VM app, which I've done already down here, well then I go and add a version. And it's the version that makes me have to specify the source package. And then how do I install it? How do I uninstall it? How do I update it? I have to give it the commands to do those things. So the whole point here is that I create these artifacts in my gallery that I then make available to, hey, what, whatever I choose to. And that's really the beauty of this thing. I have a lot of control over how this is actually made available to things. Okay. VMware, it's weird. So. Azure runs on Hyper-V. It is not running on ESX, it runs on Hyper-V. You don't care for the most part. You shouldn't care. It's infrastructure as a service. The hypervisor underneath should be invisible to you. You're using the Azure Resource Manager control plane. You're getting exposed managed disks. You're getting exposed software-defined networking with virtual networks. What some bit of software does underneath to give you a virtual machine, which everything else builds on, you shouldn't care. But there's a certain skill set I need to interact with the Azure Resource Manager. Maybe I'm in such a rush, I need to just get out of my data center, move my ESX VMs into Azure. I don't have time to retool or learn this. I just want to take what I know and run it in Azure. So that's what the Azure VMware solution is. 
It's a first party Azure service in partnership with VMware where I get hosts in Azure. Now what I'm basically creating is a private cloud and I create clusters inside that cloud and I create hosts of certain types with certain capabilities. So you can see the different types of host types, the size, there's different versions of ESXi, then I have different cluster versions that I can leverage. You'll see there's different things like VMware HCX and NSXT, all these things. But what it's boiling down to, what I'm really doing here is, where's my picture? There we go, there we are. What it's boiling down to is within a certain region, so I can think, okay, I have a certain region, that's a boundary. We talked about this many, many times. A region acts as a, a boundary for things. So then I'm gonna create an Azure VMware solution private, was it service? Azure VMware solution, I think. I'm gonna create a cloud. So that cloud has certain characteristics of it. One of the big things at the cloud level I have is it has to have connectivity. Now the connectivity, this is not using Azure Software Defined Networking, it can't. So what it does to interact with other things, it's using ExpressRoute. So we have a Microsoft Enterprise Edge that it connects to. So it is using ExpressRoute for any connectivity to anything outside. So if I wanted to then go and talk to, for example, other things in Azure, it could be a storage account, it could be a VNet, it's actually going via ExpressRoute. If I then want to go and talk and manage things from my on-premises environment, well, my on-premises environment has got a connection and I'm using ExpressRoute Global Reach because essentially here, this is one express route connection. This is a different express route connection. And what does Global Reach do, do? It lets me connect to different things I have connected over different express route circuits. So now I use Global Reach to enable me to talk to and from my on-premises. If I was running like vCenter, for example, down here, It's actually doing it over ExpressRoute Global Reach. So I create a private cloud. The private cloud integrates with the Microsoft Enterprise Edge. It's on the back end, I have an ExpressRoute. I can go and talk to storage accounts. I could go and talk to Azure NetApp files. And then within that private cloud, I can create clusters. So I create clusters. I can create between one and 12 per private cloud. This will be made up of hosts. I have between three and 16 hosts per cluster. And then this has things like the virtual SAN. That's how the storage is working unless I go and use Azure NetApp files in addition. It has NSX, it is obviously running ESXi. And then on top of that, I create my VMs. So that's the Azure VMware solution. I'm bringing my existing knowledge, my existing technologies, and I want to quickly migrate it into Azure. So that's the whole point of the Azure VMware solution. So if I'm in a rush, I need to just get out of my on-prem data center, okay, I can do exactly that. That's an option that I can leverage. I want to talk about VM scale sets. It's the last thing we're going to cover because um, it's a really important topic. Most of the time in Azure, I don't want one instance, I want multiple instances so I can be over um, multiple availability zones. I have that resiliency, I have scale. But remember, our demand changes over time. So what do we do is we scale. So the whole point is, well, hey, yeah, look, at one moment in time, I have three instances. And then at another moment in time, I'm busier, let's just do it. So I'm busier, well, oh, when it's busy, I have to create additional instances. Then when it's quiet, maybe I, I scale back again. So a key thing that I need is scale. I have to be able to scale in and out. That's 
core to me being able to use the cloud. That's what's gonna get me the benefit of only paying for what I need, but to make sure I do have that. Now, remember, from a resiliency perspective, <laughs> I like the idea of two minimum. Now, some things will scale to zero. Basically, it stops. I just scale it to zero, it's not running at all. Or one, but with one, I mean one rack, or I mean one data center. If something happened, I'm down. So I might think about a certain minimum that I think about. I might also have a initial, maybe I start at three. I might have also the idea of, well, some max. I have some max number, which is the most I'm allowed to scale to. And within that, to make this scaling decision, what do I use? So maybe it's, hey, if the CPU is above a certain threshold, so maybe it's above 70%, add two instances. But if it's not doing anything, if it's at 30%, well then subtract two instances. Maybe it's based on a queue depth, and I can use the same logic, but this time it's some queue. Hey, there's an average of two items per number of instances on the queue. I should add an instance. So I follow, I have a whole set of rules that I can create to guide that. And what I want for this, this is auto scale. I'm not manually scaling, it's automatically scaling based on something that's happening. Now, I've got this set up, and I wanna actually show this. I'll start this now, so I can come back and show it in a second. So I create the VM scale set, and what I've done right now, there's one instance. But I've got scaling rules. And um, you can add as many rules as you want, but I've got two rules. I've got scale out, and a scale in. My scale out simply says, hey look, if the number of messages is greater than two, based on the number of instances currently running, so it's dividing it. So if there were four instances and there were six messages, well that's not more than two per instance. So it's considering the total number to how many it should trigger based upon. I won't do that. Hey, if it's more than two per instance, so if there was four instances, it'd have to be more than eight, then add one. But if the queue depth, again, the total number, is less than or equal to one, well then I wanna remove one. And this is just monitoring, in my case, a storage account. So this approximate message is actually a storage queue, and it's this particular storage account, and it's this queue called test queue. So just super quick, if I go to Storage Explorer and look at that queue, it's actually got one message. So let's add some. I don't even have to put any data in it. All it cares about is some stuff. So I'm gonna put four messages on there. And what I'll see, and I will come back to this, but what I should see fairly quickly is the rules will wake up and the rules will say, hey, um, my logic has broken now. There's two or more. Look, and you can see it, it's doing creating. So it's spun off and it's starting to actually create that virtual machine already. So it's now spinning up a new instance because of my rule. Now the rule also has like a, a cool down period because what I don't want to do is say, hey, my queue depth is greater than this, go and create a new one. And then 10 seconds later it says, my queue depth is still greater than this, go and create another one. It might take three or four minutes to create the VM. Then inside the VM, it has to do some things to warm up and start processing. So as part of the rules, you also saw there was a, an interval of time I added before it starts doing other things. But I'm just gonna let that run. So, 
There are virtual machine scale sets that, as you just saw, can automatically create and delete VMs based on rules. I could manually change the scale as well. I might say, hey, I want three, I want five. I could write a logic app. I could write an Azure function to trigger off of a schedule to change the numbers. There's different things I can do. But there's two modes of virtual machine scale sets now. There's flexible. This is the current, the modern, the preferred. But there's also uniform. It's the legacy, but it is still supported. Um, and both uniform, in fact, this is all uniform can do, but flexible via profile, I can feed it a configuration and I can feed it rules. So let's think, okay, my solution here is virtual machine scale sets. This is what's gonna do this. And remember, other things sit on top of this. AKS node pools sit on top of this, a lot of the appliances, many things use this. But I have two modes. We have flex, which is really the current, the preferred one, and I guess I'll, I'll be mean. And then we have uniform, which is kind of on the way out. But there are actually some things today that only uniform does, but this is really considered the legacy. It restricts a lot of things. The VMs it creates are not regular VMs, there's limited things I can do and interact with them. Whereas the virtual machine scale set, is just a virtual machine. So both of them though support a profile. And remember it's that profile that lets me do the auto scale. That's the powerful bit that goes and creates as things happen. But what Flex lets me also do is other, v other VMs. So I can add other VMs into a Flex orchestration mode. So if I actually just carry on this for a second, so it works very differently. I can just create an empty flex. Now if I do it in the portal, it's gonna tell me to create a profile because it assumes most people creating VMSS, they wanna create that auto scale, that profile of some template. But I actually don't have to. I could have just a completely empty VMSS flex. Then I can add any type of VM. I could mix spot and non-spot within there. I can have 20 different types of VM. I could have N series and A series and A is going away, D series. And then I can have that VM profile if I want to, but VMs are VMs. They're not this special precious unicorn that VMSS did. If we go and look for a second. So firstly, okay, so that finished. And then let's just be mean for a second. Then let's DQ a bunch of messages. So what is it, one or less? Let's make it just one message now. Now remember, I think it's gonna wait, I don't know how if it's been five minutes yet, but it's not gonna do any other scaling action for a period of time. But what we should see eventually is this will say, oh, it's just gonna delete it. But before it deletes it, if I look at VMs, they're just regular VMs. They're just there. I can interact with them, I can see them, I can do anything I want. Likewise, when I create a VM, if I do the same region, and I don't need any of that, I can select VM scale set, and I can join it to the same virtual machine scale set. I can do exactly the same thing. I can mix other things. So that's a completely different capability than we had with the old uniform. The uniform was only the profile. I couldn't have anything else inside it. Whereas with this nice little um, flex, I can mix different things inside there. So that, that's one of the, the huge capabilities. Now, one thing to understand when we talk about VM scale sets, I really wanna make this point super clear. So realize what we're doing. We're deleting and we're creating, deleting, recreating. So what does that mean? What it means is when I think of what these are, they are, and I'm not gonna take a lot of time to draw this picture. They're tin soldiers. It's an X-Man, I don't know. <laughs> They're tin soldiers. If it's broke, I delete it. I create a new one. What they're not, well they're not, P 
Pets. It's, I like Garfield. There we go. It's not a pet. It's not some unique butterfly that I have to care about. If it's broken, I replace it. It has no state that I care about. The state's in some other tier because I'm constantly deleting, recreating, deleting, recreating. This is the key point. This can't have some unique special thing that I care about because I want to just delete and recreate these whenever I want. So I, I have to really think about that capability. So let's see if we were one yet. Yeah, let's have a look. Yep, and it's gone. So we could actually go and look now. And what's really nice is if I look at this, so the instances now I've just got one. If we go and look at scaling, it will show me the run history. So over seven days, I can see my scale events have gone from sort of one to two. It will show me sort of the JSON of different actions. It has AI. So I've got predictive turned on and it will show me, hey, what it's seen, what the CPU use has been. Now I'm not using that today, but if I have um, policy and I'm using CPU metrics in an average mode, I can have predictive auto scale. So I think it has to watch for seven days, ideally 14, but I could turn on enabled. Now it won't let me because I don't have the CPU counter as a scale. So again, you have to turn on percentage CPU and it has to be average time aggregation. But if, you've, if you were doing that and monitoring that, it will have learned what the use actually was and once it understands that, rather than waiting for the CPU to peg at 90% and then there's a delay, it will start scaling in advance of when it would have been needed so you don't have any impact on those end users. So that's a really nice capability. But you can see all of the history of those actions. I've got a little PowerShell script that I wrote, for example, if I jump over to here. So if I look at my view scale logs, um, let's see if I can even run this, just run it. Oh, I've done something wrong. Oh, because I've turned on that, it's funny. It's saying it doesn't like about my script. So I've changed other things. Oh, I was trying to stop. I didn't want to do that at all. I should not have run that whole script. But basically what I want to do is if I get the resource type, ordinarily, I forgot I added in a stop at the end of this. But what I could do is I can go and get the activity log and then search for auto scale events. So up or down, and then I can just query for those things and get them. So I would be able to just, hey, what do I care about just for the different logs? It says my resources. And if I went and got all of the logs, yeah, I'm doing something wrong. I'll fix that later on. But anyway, this script is in the repo. I don't fully understand why that's not working. I was playing around a lot with some of the um, code just before I started. So I obviously have forgot to change one thing in here. I don't remember which thing I broke. But essentially that would go and dump out all of the different lists. I'll fix it when you go and look at the repo. But I don't have to even use that, really. If I just go to the portal, and I looked at the activity log, in the activity log itself, if we scroll down, and this is all I was doing from that PowerShell, but this is like last six hours, it will show me a log for the scale actions. So auto scale, up, auto scale down. So they're in the portal. So if I'm curious about what scale actions have happened, they're right there for you. And finally, just some nice little features. And some of them are not in Flex today, but they're coming. Hey, it's gonna balance across zones. If I do a fault domain equals one, it will balance across as many fault domains as it can. I have a spot mix available in VMSS Flex. So what that lets me do is as part of the profile, I can actually do a spot mix to say, hey, I would ideally like 80% uh, spot, hey, as cheap as I can, realizing they may get kicked out, but I can do that. There's also some nice things in spot today where it can try and auto bring you back in intelligently so you've got less chance of being evicted again. But I have um, those capabilities. Flex also does a faster provisioning. 
because it's built on the newer arm, I'm gonna get faster provisioning when I use Flex. So I can have a mix that I tell it. It has a rolling update of the profile. So if there is a new OS image, it will do that availability first rolling out of the new version across all of my different VMSS. So maybe it does, hey, a third at a time. If there's a problem, hey, it can go and actually roll it back. If I change the VM profile, I change the SKU, I add a disk to it, again, it would do a rolling update, not take down the whole thing. It would let me change a certain portion of it at any one time. Auto image update, again, as I kind of talked about, if there's a change to the image version, roll it out over time. It can auto heal, auto remediate. There's a health probe, I can add a custom health probe that will actually go and look at an app, a TCP or a HTTP probe inside it, and based on the response, it can tell if the app is healthy, not just the Azure resource is healthy. Instance repair if it detects there is a problem. Again, it's a tin soldier. If it's not healthy, we delete it and recreate it. I can do a scale in policy. Do I delete the newest created ones first or the oldest created ones first? I can get termination notifications. So when it is gonna delete a VM, well, it can send a notification inside the VM and then based on that notification, if we go and look super quick at my code, where's my code gone? There we go. If I look at my code, I can query the instance meta, which we talked about before, but I can see, hey, are there any sort of scheduled events? I can go and query and find out if anything's coming at me. And I would see, for example, hey, look, there's gonna be a termination. And then I could poll that periodically. And what that would let me do is before Azure just go and meanly turns me off, I might do some things inside the guest OS to cleanly shut something down, to stop something, and then it can go and delete me. And I can specify a delay on that to let me close down cleanly. So that's a, a really nice feature to be able to have that. There's instance protection. So that's where maybe something isn't quite as equal as others, the old George Orwell um, animal farm scenario. Especially in that VMSS flex, where maybe I've got regular VMs I've added to it, it would scale those in equally, it would just delete them. Today, I would use a resource lock on those, so it couldn't delete them. But instance protection is coming for Flex, so I could mark certain VMs as, hey, I don't want you touched, um, do not do those. One thing that's different for Flex than Uniform, Uniform had a over-provision mode. If it tried to create one VM, it would create two. And then whichever one created first is the one it would keep and it would discard the other one. Flex does not do that. The reason for the over-provisioning was in earlier days, success for provisioning of resources was a lot lower than it is today. Today it's well over lots of nines. It generally doesn't happen. So there's not much benefit in that over-provision. So it doesn't over-provision when I use VMSS Flex. So just realize that behavior is not being carried form from uniform to Flex. But this really is, when I think of scaling, I generally don't want to create VMs. If I'm creating VMs, normally I want multiple instances. I don't want pets. Um, we want the tin soldiers. We want the, hey, they're not special, one falls down, we put another one in its place. So I wanna use VMSS with the, the configurations with those profiles that remember to create this, to actually do this whole creation as part of that profile. Well, it's the profile that says, hey, it's this particular SKU. It's this particular OS image. It's these extensions, etc. And that is what gonna drive creating the VM. So I don't really wanna create manual VMs if I can help it. I always wanna be using those virtual machine scale sets. That's gonna give me the real best experience. So as always, we covered a lot of stuff. As always, I hope this was super, super useful. and. I'll see you on the next masterclass. Take care.